just uh, for your information, I'm waiting for a phone call, so I might have to step out for a few minutes. Hello, welcome to our special board meeting today, um, November 24th, 2020. We would like to call this meeting to order. Can we have a roll call, please, Jenny? Amy Phillips? Present. Sherry Lincoln? Present. Scott Lehrman? Present. Jesse Campos? Let's see him on the call yet. That's Steve Christensen? Present. Risa Hernandez. Nichelle Lynn. Present. Krista Martinez. Present. Thank you. Okay, got it. Um, all right, we will um Ms. We will turn the time over to Ms. Whitney for the for the rest of the agenda. So good evening, Board President Phillips, members of the school board. I'm here tonight to share an updated recommendation from Ben Franklin County Health. So the purpose of our meeting is to provide a status report of our community health conditions. I'll be presenting um, the Washington State Health data that is housed on the Ben Franklin Health District's website and the indicators and thresholds for risk of introduction of uh, COVID transmission into schools. Uh, we refer that lovingly to the rainbow chart. Um, you'll recognize it when you see it. And then also to share the Ben Franklin Health District's latest recommendation, and we will be requesting some action from you as a board tonight regarding their recommendation to maintain at-home learning for our middle school and high school students until the community health conditions support moving forward. So we'll jump right in with the health districts or the Washington State dashboard that is housed on the um, Ben Franklin Health's website. So as of the November, the week of October 27th to November 9th, our community had 471.1 cases per 100,000 of newly diagnosed COVID cases. We recognize that uh, that data looks different in the out weeks, but that's the last completed set of data that's on the Washington Department of Health dashboard. So when you look at our trend data, um, you can see that he, the dot here represents the 471 cases that I just mentioned. But you can also see this dotted line that is what is called uh, incomplete data. I just wanted to highlight a couple of pieces right here. One, what we know about the incomplete data is that it always changes. And it most often, if not every time I've looked at it, that the changes equal an increase. So in the incomplete data, this peak right here represents um, 705.5 cases and then this downward dip right here equals 616.8 cases. I would fully expect that data to change by the time it's completed. This uh, slide represents our newly or new hospitalizations of people per 100,000. The dot right here represents the 7.4 that is indicated here. But when you, um, these, I just wanted to point out that this peak right here is from the week of the 4th through the 10th, and it is 10.6 new hospitalizations per 100,000. And then as it the trends down, it kind of pops back up and then levels out. This is 5.3%. And that is the week of November 13th through the 19th. We had a community suggestion in our last board meeting that asked that we also provide the hospitalization data for Benton County. This is Benton County's. So again, 4.5 at the dot, but then um, I just highlighted this peak right here is November 6th through the 12th, and that's 9.4%, and then it dips down to the November 13th through the 19th is 3.5%. Let me ask a question. You said percent, or, but then the graph says patients. Is it patients or percent? I'm sorry, it's patients. Thank you, Scott. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is a percent, however. So um, 
This data set represents the percentage of positive tests. Again, the dot represents 17.9%. This peak here is for the week of November 8th through the 14th, and that's 25.57%. And then you can see this here, um, the lowest point here represents uh, November 13th through the 19th, and that's 24.4%. So this is Franklin County's data for percentage of licensed beds occupied by COVID cases. And you can see we've had all kinds of peaks and valleys over time, and this is at 3.2%. And again, by request of a community member, we've also given you the data for Benton County, and there the dot represents 8%. So this, um, as I move forward, this is what I now lovingly refer to as the rainbow chart is from the CDC. The This above here represents a continuum of transmission from lowest to highest. So when you plot the data that I just spoke to you about on the chart, um, you can see where we fall out in Franklin County. We're at the highest uh, rate of transmission for cases and percentage of uh, positive cases in the last 14 days. This is about our mitigation strategies. And you'll notice that that dot or the X has moved kind of over into the middle. And this really has to do with, we're very still very confident in our ability to wear masks and social distance and practice good hygiene and edit, or respiratory etiquette and clean and disinfect. This really has to do with contact tracing. Um, given the increase in cases in our community, both at the health department and in um, people who are reporting to us that they've tested positive, it's been an increase in an impact to our contact tracing team. So for example, yesterday we had 14 cases reported um, and each of those cases is a is a is a open investigation where our contact tracing team digs into those. So um, it it the, the X moving over to the middle here does not represent our inability to contact trace. We're still very confident in our team's ability to, to do that. It's just an, an impact when you're contact tracing and communicating about 14 cases. Um, in a given day. This uh, second part of the, the quote unquote rainbow chart, the top is the, you compare the recent seven days to the seven day previous. And um, as you can see in the, the charted plot data, um, there's been a pretty significant increase. So we're at the highest risk of transmission in that area. And then the next, the rest of the rows really focus on our hospitalization or our, our local hospital's ability to navigate um, people who are needing beds. And so percentage of hospital inpatient beds in our community is still well under the 80%. Um, we do not have the information about intensive care is not available on the dashboard. So that I leave that one blank. And then you can see percentage of hospital inpatient beds in the community that are occupied by COVID in Franklin County, it's in the lowest, and in Benton County, it's in the um, lower. This uh, row here is left blank because that's data that I would need to get in collaboration and coordination with the health department. And um, I, our our call is are typically on Thursday, and so um, I didn't have an opportunity to connect last week. And then, of course, this week is no no meeting because of the holiday. So I'll pause there and answer any questions that you have about the data. So with that, I'm going to just jump right in to um, the recommendations. So just by summary, you as a board took action on October 27th and you approved transitioning middle school and high school to blended learning. Um, on December 3rd, which would be the first day of the new trimester, provided three things. One, there was a successful phase in of elementary students, our community health conditions supported moving forward, and that any additional mitigation strategies that would be required by the health department could be implemented. On the 18th of November, we received an updated recommendation from our local health department. Based on a variety of factors, our health department is asking that Kenwick, Pasco, and Richland school districts remain in at-home learning with our middle school and high school students. All students who are currently attending in person, including elementary and our small groups of secondary students who've been deemed educationally at risk under this recommendation could continue to attend in person. 
The next slides are really just a verbatim of a quote from the entire Benton Franklin um, Health District letter. I know as a board, you received this letter. It's been posted on the website. It's been available to the community and social media. So I'm not gonna read every bullet point, but I just wanted to highlight the rationale that the health department has given us for their recommendation. So the health department continues to be very committed to returning our students to the in-person education experience. And there's a recognition that this is a very fluid process. The disease burden within our community fluctuates and the health department is watching who's getting the virus, where the outbreaks are occurring and where and how schools are seeing success and really looking at um, all aspects of education, including the safety net that school, students being on an on campus at school, that safety net that's provided, especially for those students who have barriers of success, success, barriers to success at home. So we are seeing a rapid increase of what the health department terms disease burden in our community. And so um, again, these are Dr. Person's words. She says, I must amend the recommendation that Richland, Pasco and Kenwood School Districts pause the phase to return um, middle school and high school students. So she talks about that over the last two weeks that the number of cases has increased, but she also provides some additional data for to illustrate additional data points that support her recommendation to have secondary students continue at home learning. So you see an upward trend in cases, but you also see an upward trend in positivity tests, new cases per day over 14 days, and then also increase in hospitalizations. So some might be wondering why secondary and not elementary. And it, um, again, as it's outlined in the health department's letter, the age range of 10 to 19, that is where the health department, when they did the data analysis to put forth this recommendation on the 18th, saw that there were um, a higher rate of increase in that particular age range. It was 3.9 times higher than the disease rate for elementary students. So when you compare elementary and middle school and high school environments, um, the middle school and high school environment is a higher risk for transmission because of the frequent interactions, multiple groups of students, um, the complexity with cohorting, and then that plus the increase in the three point, or the increase in the disease rate in that age range was the rationale for pausing secondary. She goes on to talk about that when the disease rate in our community is relatively low or um, in the middle range or even kind of higher but plateauing, we have some additional options with offsetting risk with mitigation strategies. But when the disease activity has increased like it has, there's concern that there may not be a system capacity to manage the additional mitigation strategies necessary to bring thousands more students back across the entire Benton Franklin um, counties. So Dr. Person points out that she's indicated multiple times that school is not inherently dangerous or unsafe because of COVID. However, there's concern around um, the broader community impact to increased stress to the healthcare system and that schools really and as residents are being asked and businesses are being asked to do their part to uh, to mitigate that potential risk to overburdening our healthcare system that schools need to be considered as partners in that effort to um by not bringing back those those additional students so others may be wondering so why elementary and middle or why elementary um why are they being allowed to remain in person? So again, based on her letter, she states that the elementary schools and middle school or the small groups of middle school and high school students have been successful in the in-person learning and hybrid model without any disease transmission within the classroom environment, that um, the students and staff have been present in school and they're through the case investigations and contact tracing, the health department has not seen that it is um, that that's impacting the increase in cases and that she does recognize that students and staff have had to quarantine because of close contacts 
with students, but more frequently staff that have been infected, but neither secondary um, nor sustained transmission of COVID-19 have been seen in our school environments um, where we're following appropriate infection control measures. So without any evidence that the outbreak uh, of outbreak or secondary transmission in our elementary schools or in the small groups of instruction that we're providing, she's saying there's no basis for her to return those groups of students to distance learning. So the benefit to students, um, the benefit of school for many students and families has not changed and the low risk of transmission in elementaries and small groups has not changed. So those are her rationales for um, why secondary, why the pause on secondary and why she's recommending to allow elementary and our small groups of educationally at-risk students to continue in person. So we also reached out to Washington School's risk management pool for a risk analysis for the board's consideration. And based on a summary of those communications, the recommendation from our risk pool is that we follow the November 18th, 2020 amended recommendation from our health officer. So at that point, I'm gonna pause and let the board, um, you can ask me questions, engage in any discussion and uh, President Phillips, when you deem it appropriate, there is uh, an action slide next. And so you just let me know when you're ready to, to move to action. And I'm happy to answer any questions that, that I can and help with any discussion the board would like to have. Thank you, Superintendent Whitney. Are there any questions or discussion from the board? Okay, I did notice too, I don't know, I keep track of this pretty well. And and right now it says the Franklin County case rate is 100 and, or 824. I don't know if you can see that, um, which is the, which is considerably higher than what you gave us because that, that data is lacking. So 824 cases per 100,000, it is, it has really skyrocketed. So, um, so that data was quite a bit less. Um, realizing that Washington State's data is behind. Um, if Amy, there, no one has, Amy, yes, there's also a there's also a difference in the way that the Washington Health Department categorizes data and the way that we look at data locally, and it has to do with I think locally we do it from, and I can't remember which one it is. One does it from the date of the specimen collection, and one does it from the date of reported onset of symptoms. So that that has okay. something to do. Sometimes when those data don't exactly align, that that's part of part of the issue too. And I can't remember which one's which, but the local health department doesn't doesn't track the data in the same way that the Washington Department of Health does. Okay, great. Well, that's good to know. All right, can we move to the action slide, please? Yes, I would I would just say thanks for the presentation and thanks for the health department for providing input to us. I, people who want to go and look and figure out where Dr. Persons and other people are getting this data on our Benton Franklin um, Health Department website, you can go and look at the plots of this data and you can disaggregate it into age groups. And if you go and disaggregate, I think if I remember the ages were like five to 14 is one of them, 14 to 19, and then it, it goes in 10 year increments after that. but. You can see exactly what she's saying there. It's pretty straightforward that when you look at the the 5 to 14 age group, the slope for increasing in cases in our county has, has not increased since we've opened school. Granted, we only have a week and a half of data there and maybe maybe we're not seeing something that's happening. But when you look at that data, it, it shows that, not to say that the kids, the younger kids can't spread it, if they were out doing everything that adults are doing, whether it's in the personal life or in their jobs, maybe that rate would be increasing, but you can go and look at it for the last month or two and, and that data backs up exactly what Michelle just presented to us. So I appreciate the information and the input from the health department. So I've got a couple of comments. So, First of all, just a comment that 
there are feelings on both sides of this. I mean, some people feeling we need to go back to school. Some some people feeling we need to shut down even the students who are in school. <clears throat> so, and I recognize that there's pretty strong feelings both ways. Uh, I think for us, fortunately or unfortunately, we are somewhat bound by the recommendations from the health department. I mean, certainly we can go our own way and just say we're going to go to school regardless, but I think it would be prudent for us to follow the direction or recommendations of the health department. Uh, as far as risk management, they're not going to support us. Well, I shouldn't say they won't. I mean, we are at risk. We don't know that they would support anything, any lawsuit that comes up. So while I think there are people who are thinking that we should, you know, I, I think the prudent thing is to follow the recommendation of our health department. So. That's kind of where we are. Um, so not to be, I mean, not that we can't think for ourselves and do our own thing, but certainly I think wisdom would be that we follow those directions. So thanks for the presentation, Michelle. As far as the action goes, I'm not sure what the action is. I didn't see one in the packet yesterday. Okay. So my question would be, do we need action? Because in the last board meeting, we we gave action to start on or after December 3rd. So uh, I would ask, is there a reason that we're taking Yeah, that? so it's, it's a great question, Steve, and we talked a lot about it as district staff, because certainly your recommendation, the what you approved last time was us opening if those three conditions are in place. Well, this letter says one of those conditions is not in place. So you could argue that you've already acted. Um, some could be confused by that. So we're offering you the opportunity to take action in public just to clarify for people that you're accepting this newest recommendation. We felt like it was just cleaner and less confusing, but certainly as a board, um, you know, if, if you feel differently, we can just be on the record as, as an acknowledgement that you've already actually taken this action. So it just is, Board governance is confusing for, for people that don't do it every day. So we just felt like this was the cleaner path forward, but should the board have strong feelings, I think we could make a rationale that you have already acted. Uh-oh. Steve disappeared. Okay, I think we need to take the action. So I would entertain a motion. Okay, uh, I move to accept the Benton Franklin health district update recommendation to continue current level of in-person learning including elementary students and small groups of secondary students deemed educationally at risk um, <clears throat> serve middle school and high school students with at-home learning until community health conditions support moving forward second the motion oh you're muted amy Okay, we have a motion and a second for the action before us. Is there any discussion from the board? So just a question. So in essence, we're leaving it open-ended at this point. We're not we're not setting an additional date at this time. It's just correct. To stay in our current mode until we until the health department gives us different direction. Correct. Um, I'd like to say something. It was interesting. We were at a school board. Um, I guess we weren't at one because we, it was virtual. We were at home, but um, at, attending a virtual um, school WASDA, which is the Washington State School Board Association, where all of the school board members from across the state of Washington were present. We got to hear from um, the state superintendent, Chris Reidahl, and the WASDA president, Tim Garcho. Garcho Chow. And both of those men urged us to follow our local, um, our, our county um, health department, our local health department. And he said, so that if you don't, it just leaves us open for, for legal, legal um, lawsuits. And I think it's really important to realize that we have to have insurance. We have to protect our, because, because we're just, we're not going to, put ourselves in a position 
where we can be financially hit like that. So it's really important that we follow that recommendation. The other reason I think it's really important is I have followed Amy Person's recommendations from the beginning. And at first I was a little irritated at how some things were going until I really dug into the data she supported. And I was impressed with the thoroughness of what she researched and the, and the quality of the research. And I really respect her recommendations. They are very up to date. She keeps us up as close as possible to what currently is going on. I know she has the best interest of our community at heart. There are reasons to have our elementary school still stay in school and our high school wait until after the first of the year. So, so I just, I encourage any of you that are struggling with this to look at those recommendations and the research that she has done. Are there any other comments? Mrs. Richardson, can we have a roll call? Oh, excuse me. So there's a, do I need to repeat this motion and second? So there's a motion and a second to, for the action to move to accept that, or excuse me, to accept the Brandon Franklin district updated recommendation to continue learning current level of in-person learning, including elementary students and small groups of secondary students deemed educationally at risk, serve middle school students and high school students with at-home learning until the community health decisions support moving forward. Can I have a roll call vote, please, Mrs. Richardson? Mr. Christensen? Yes. Ms. Lincoln? Yes. Mr. Campos? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Lehrman? Yes. So the motion has passed. So I did want to talk a little bit about next steps. So we're going to continue to monitor the community health conditions in collaboration with state and local and state public health officials. Um, and it those it's kind of twofold, the timing of a potential rolling back based on community health conditions or the timing of potentially moving forward uh, based on community health conditions. We'll provide the board an update on the on December 8th regarding the community health conditions um, and that process. So um, be looking forward to doing that on the 8th. We'll also provide the board an update of the operational impacts of educating elementary and small groups of secondary students in person. And some of the pieces that you'll be hearing from us is uh, the complexity of maintaining substitutes during this environment. Um, we'll give you an update for enrollment of students who are attending in person versus at home. Um, we'll let you know about our, our plan to enhance the support for our at-home only learners. We have that plan and we'll be launching that and we'll update you about that on the 8th. And then um, how that impacts then some additional options for staff who need accommodations for work from home. So those are some areas that you can um, be looking forward to us updating you about uh, at our next meeting. I did want to end the this part of the presentation with uh, the excerpts, the, the finish the letter from Dr. Persons where she really, and, and even in conversation with Dr. Persons, she really uh, celebrates this community. And she said, you know, in late July and August, this community really doubled down its efforts. And because of that, we saw a very quickly lowered disease rate. Um, and she remains hopeful that the community could do that again in the face of this escalation of cases. She stated in order for public health to be successful, we need a recommitment to uh, bolster alignment of goals among our medical business and community leaders and the community as a whole, and just encourages all of us as residents of this community to play a key role in reducing transmission by wearing face coverings, maintaining social distance, avoiding gatherings with people outside of our household and staying home if we're sick or have had a close contact with someone who has COVID-19. So um, I, I wanted to highlight those words from Dr. Person as we finish. And, and I also wanted to recognize the extraordinary efforts of our student or our teachers and our staff and our administrators who are currently serving students in person, especially as the case counts have continued to increase. People are selflessly reporting on site, even in face of their own uncertainty and their own concern to provide service for our kids because they know and believe in what in 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 public education and and what in-person instruction does for our kids so 
that is no small thing that our teachers and our, our staff that are reporting on site every day is doing. And I, I really feel like in this moment, especially up against Thanksgiving in a moment where we should all be reflecting on the things we're thankful for, that it's important to acknowledge those people who are really at the front line of providing a service that our community has asked them to provide for our youth. So as I sit down on Thanksgiving and I, and I go through all of the list of the blessings in my life, each and every administrator, teacher, employee, bus driver, um, district office admin, school board member will be on that list. This has been an incredible journey we're on and we're, it's not over yet. And I have full confidence that we'll lean into this together and make our way through it together and come out the other side stronger for having done it together. So thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Whitney. Are there any other comments from the board before we adjourn this meeting? All right, this meeting will be adjourned.